What's going on, everybody? I thought I'd try something new today. So here's a live stream. And I wanted to talk to you about Heidegger, how to get interested in Heidegger, and specifically about this work right here, Contributions to Philosophy of the Event. Um, more important work than being in time, I would say, even. But let's take a few steps back. How does this even work? Okay, if you want to write anything, go ahead. I haven't done a live stream before, so we're just testing it out. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this book, as I was saying, Contributions to Philosophy of the Event by Heidegger. So the first thing I think you should know is how to get, oh, hello, great, great to know that it's working well, thanks. Um, one point I wanted to address was how a person could get into Heidegger in the first place. Because it's not obvious that you would just jump into thinking about metaphysics and history and what it means to exist, being, all of those kinds of things. Well, I'll tell you what it was in my case, see whether you find that helpful. And I'd like to know from you, if you've already read some Heidegger, how you got into him and how you found the experience, what makes sense to you, what doesn't make sense to you. Thanks a lot in the comments, I appreciate it. Good to know. Um, so one of the ways to get into Heidegger, let me tell you, I have a, a good friend who studied with me at the University of British Columbia. His name's Kenji. You see him on Twitter sometimes if you look at the people that I follow. He's a great translator um, into and out of Japanese. He also works on Hegel. Very bright guy, the smartest guy I met as an undergraduate. And at some point I remember he started a reading group on being in time. And I opened up the book. I saw a lot of Greek and a lot of dense terminology. And I thought, I'm not ready for this. It's going to take a little bit of prep, a little bit of preparation. So you might find the same thing when you look at being in time. It's not a work that you just necessarily jump into. It has some prerequisites, but it can be made accessible to you, I think. So let me ask of the people who are um, here now, do you study philosophy? Have you, have you taken philosophy classes? Have you read the classics of philosophy or, or not? Because the entrance point is going to be different depending on where you're coming from. So feel free to write um, anything about your background there, how you got into philosophy. But if you know Descartes, Descartes' meditations, the basic idea you might have, I'm sure you've heard, if you didn't hear it in school, you heard it somewhere else, that Descartes said, let's do this experiment where we're going to subject all of our opinions to radical doubt until we can find something that we know for sure can be a foundation of truth. Because you can doubt Okay, you look at me, you see me talking on a live stream. Before too long, it's going to be possible to think that this is artificial intelligence, that it's a deep fake, that somebody has mim mimicked my voice and my look, and is just like you've probably seen Jordan Peterson rapping Eminem. Artificial intelligence is getting pretty advanced in that sense. So this could be, uh, this could be an illusion. Or maybe this is a pre-recorded video that I'm playing or something like that. So... There are many reasons why you could doubt the experience that you're having, as you know, if you've read Descartes and, and done the meditations with him. But the idea is that at some point you get to this recognition. And I think it's really important that you treat this not as some separate abstract idea, something that some philosopher somewhere once said, but that you have the experience yourself. You have to try, in my opinion, same thing when you're reading Heidegger to an extent. You have to try to replicate the experience of philosophical insight. So in the case of reading Descartes, you have to try to ex truly experience radical doubt about the existence of everything that you're experiencing, of everything that you know and think you know, until you have this moment where you're left in your interior uh, monologue or dialogue with the last remaining unshakable revelation to yourself from consciousness that you are you are a thinking being too much talking this car goes out so if you have an experience like that and you get to the idea that the only thing that exists is your consciousness or a stream of consciousness 
then it's not that there's a, a direct step from Descartes to Heidegger, but what I want to encourage you to do is try in each case to have the philosophical experience for yourself and not to treat it as something outside of yourself. And that's crucial when you get to this book, pretty much when you get to all of Heidegger, but especially uh, here, because this is what I want to talk to you about, Heidegger's contributions to philosophy of the event. If you just start right at the very beginning, I'll take the liberty of reading out to you what he says, and you'll see exactly um, what I mean. So he says, the official title, Contributions to Philosophy of the Event, that's the official title, it must by necessity now sound dull, ordinary, and empty, and will make it seem that at issue here are scholarly contributions to the advancement of philosophy. Like, yeah, he's going to make some contributions. Maybe he's going to show some logical derivations or deductions and make some sort of contribution to the field of philosophy at the margins. That's what the name suggests. And that's what it can only suggest, he says, because philosophical terms, even the word philosophy itself, have lost their power. So he says, philosophy can be officially announced no other way since all essential titles have become impossible on account of the exhaustion of every basic word and the destruction of the genuine relation to words. So crucial for Heidegger, we've become so alienated from the meaning of words that we use. We have a techn technical relationship to them, a technological relationship to them. We're alienated from the essence of the language that we use. And here he says right off the bat, that's how people are gonna hear this title, Contributions to Philosophy. Like it's going to be some lame book that you pick up off a of philosophy bookshelf in your local Indigo or something like that. Well, the official title, he says, is also in accord with the, with the essential matter to the extent that in the age of transition from metaphysics to the thinking of being in its historicality, I'm going to explain all of this. I'm going to do my best to explain all of this to you, whoever's here and whoever cares. In an age of transition from metaphysics to the thinking of being in its historicality, no more can be ventured than an attempt at a thinking which would arise out of a more originary basic position within the question of the truth of being. Okay, so his first paragraph was like, contribution sounds like lame and sterile and dull, but actually suddenly he gets into a language that may be less familiar. So I want to explain some of that to you. Crucially, the first use of the word being here that I read to you is in English, B-E-Y-N-G. In German, it's S-E-Y-N. Now, usually you know in English it would be B-E-I-N-G. That's your typical spelling of being. But the B-E-Y-N-G, being with a Y, it's crucial to distinguish Heidegger's sense of being outside of the philosophical tradition that he calls metaphysics, outside of the trajectory from Plato to Nietzsche. The new inception of philosophy, the new meditation on being, it's not going to be being ontologically or metaphysically considered in the ways that we're familiar with, and therefore it must be demarcated with some different indication, which he uses here B-E-Y-N-G or S-E-Y-N. So I have to say sometimes being with an I, being with a Y. In this case, he says the philosophy of another beginning is going to be a thinking of being with a Y outside of the history of metaphysics. And it's going to be a thinking of being in its historicality. So being here is not going to be an eternal, timeless, out, out, abstract essence. It's somehow going to be being in history or more precisely being as history. So he says, even the successful attempt at a philosophy of another beginning, at a new thinking about what it means to be, what being is and what we are in our relationship to being. Even a successful attempt must, in conformity with the basic event of that which is to be thought, so he's not just going to think a series of propositions, he's going to think an experience that you have to undergo here, sort of like a revelation, as it were. It must keep its distance from every false claim to be a work in the previous style. So this isn't just an open exposition in an essay form of something that he already knows. Future thinking, he writes, this is still on page the first page of the introductory remarks to this book. Future thinking is a course of thought on which the hitherto altogether concealed realm of the essential occurrence of being with a Y is traversed and so is first cleared and attained in its most proper character as an event. In other words, in the very act of doing this exploratory thinking and undergoing this course of thought, you're clearing a path for a new dispensation of being, something that eluded by its very nature everybody from Plato to Nietzsche. Not because they did something wrong, because that's how it revealed itself 
in and as history. So let me pause for a minute because there are comments here in the chat. So all studying, you learn about philosophy, studying abroad, existentialism, shy on Heidegger. A lot of departments are shy on Heidegger. And I've heard anecdotally even a lot of stories about Heidegger scholars being sent to Siberia academically, so to speak. A comment, can I ask something? You are conservative or even pro-fascist. Will you be boycotted in Canada, Canada's universities, right? Well, I can say I have been, in a sense, boycotted in Canada's universities. There's an article about me in the National Post, our Canadian newspaper, about my trials and tribulations as a graduate student working on Heidegger, Dugan, and other right-wing thinkers. I had four committee members quit my dissertation committee. I had a lot of backstabbing and attempts to uh, blacklist me. And uh, successfully, in the sense that I am out of academia, and probably we're all better off for it. Another comment, don't confuse discussion of an idea for an endorsement, uh, responding to a previous person. Yeah, so I think we need to just think before we get into what's a fascist and what's a conservative. That's all, all discussion for another time. But working on Heidegger can definitely get you in trouble out of in academia, but we're out of academia for the moment. So we're good. Now, the issue, Heidegger writes, is no longer to be about something, to present something objective. And by the way, the fact that it's not objective doesn't mean that it's subjective, because he's going to try to move us beyond the dichotomy between subject and object as we've understood it. The issue is to be Here's what he writes, appropriated over to the appropriating event. In other words, the issue is to be consumed by this revelatory experience of being's disclosure to you through thinking. You're not just thinking about something with the distance that you have to it and reading off its characteristics or attributes in a way that you are over here and it's over there and all you're doing is uh, reading the writing on the wall. In fact, what's going to happen, Heidegger says, I think it's pretty amazing, still on the first page of the introduction here, the scope of these ideas reaching well beyond their quantity. He, he says, that's equivalent to an essential transformation of the human being. So that's what's at stake when you read Heidegger. Not some new piece of knowledge, but an essential transformation of the human being from rational animal to Dasein. So Dasein is something that you undergo and are conveyed to out of some essential transformation of the human being. So also what's at stake here is various definitions of what it means to be human in our relation to our understanding of being. So again, he says he's not going to be reporting on the event, but he's going to invite us and himself try to convey what it means to belong to being and to the word of being Again, being with a Y, not the being that we know traditionally, metaphysically, through the Western philosophical tradition, but this new revelation, new disclosure, and new dispensation. This book promises to be somehow an articulation of the essential transformation of the human being from a rational animal into Dasein. Now I can actually move to page two. So I'm not going to go through the whole book like that. We would be here until the end of time. Let me go here. Oswald Spengler writes, have you heard of Charles Upton, author of Dugan Against Dugan? He's trying to debate Dugan as a variant to Heidegger. Yes, he sent me some materials. Other people have sent me some materials by him. And in, this, in the reading group that I led on the fourth political theory, I addressed some of his reading of Dugan, which I thought was off the mark, just wasn't textually accurate. But my, I haven't read his book, so I have to withhold my judgment on the whole thing. And if he's seriously studying the topic thoughtfully, which he seems to be doing, then he's probably a good resource. But my work has been on the primary sources and not so much on the commentators, except to show when they are wildly wrong, which a lot of people writing about Dugan are when it comes to his, his political philosophy. So this book, again, Heidegger, we're not talking about one philosophy among, alongside another philosophies understood as ideas about objects or anything like that. It's the trans essential transformation of the human being. And in my opinion, which I'll share with you now, if you think about philosophy as the type of deep reflection that can culminate in essential transformation of the human being, 
you'll be closer to the kind of understanding of philosophy that makes some authors, it's a key in a way to understanding some authors. So I wrote my dissertation in part on this topic. I thought that Heidegger, Derrida, Leo Strauss, Dugan, they all experienced philosophy as a type of human transformation or human conversion, but they differed about its nature. And so it's a good way, good access point to understanding them. And at the very least, if you see philosophy as being concerned with the essential transformation of the human being, that puts one type of philosophy apart from a different one, which is just logical clarification of sentences using the tools of formal logic. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's a different endeavor. So I've bookmarked a couple of passages here that I just thought it could be interesting to point to and to comment on. You know, this is an experiment for me to just go live and talk about a book that's in my hands. So thanks for being here and let's try it. On, on page 30, he distinguishes philosophy and worldview. And I think it's helpful when you hear worldview in this passage to have in mind also ideology. What's the relationship, if there is one, between philosophy and ideology? What's the difference between philosophy and ideology? But I'm going to stick to his term here, worldview. Philosophy is useless, though sovereign, knowledge. Philosophy is the terrifying, though rare, questioning of the truth of being. Being with a Y. Again, what is being? Philosophy is the terrifying, though rare, questioning of the truth of being. Philosophy is the grounding of truth, while simultaneously being deprived of what is true. So I think I have to explain that briefly before I go on. So if what is true is just propositions about the way that the world is, it's true that it's not raining where I am. It's true, I'm sorry to say, that my cigar has gone out for the time being. Those are things that are true. But philosophy is not about what is true. It's the grounding of truth itself. And you have to know here, if you don't know, that Heidegger interpreted truth as, I got to simplify and distort slightly, but as the revealing of being itself, the revealing and concealing. So think about it. Oh, my wife offering me some matches for the cigar. I have a lighter, but sure, I'll take the matches. Thanks. Heidegger meditated deeply on the Greek word for truth, which basically was uh, was a um, it's like unconcealing. Truth is the unconcealing of being. So the distinction here is between just statements that are true and the fundamental original revelation or unconcealing of being itself to the thinker. So philosophy is the grounding of truth while simultaneously being deprived of what is true. Philosophy is the will to return to the beginning of history and thus is the will to surpass itself. Well, when he says it's the will to return to the beginning of history, that's right in the comments, you can see the grief there. He doesn't mean to what, 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 whatever you might think outside of Heideggerian language about the beginning of history. He doesn't mean to the first African tribes or to the proto-Indo-European. He means to the, the source of temporalization, sort of a being as the source of temporalization. Therefore, philosophy seen from the outside, and this again is a dividing line, those who see philosophy from the outside, those who see it from the inside, and we have to try to make our way to the inside. Therefore, philosophy, he writes, seen from the outside is merely something decorative, perhaps something that serves to exhibit or teach culture, perhaps also an heirloom whose ground has been lost. The many must take philosophy in that way, precisely where and when it is something needful for the few. So philosophy is not just like a cultural artifact alongside ballet and painting. And philosophy is definitely not just something that we can talk about it as something that we inherit as part of the Western tradition. We have this great corpus and we should have paintings of Plato in our political buildings so that we have some deference and honor and reverence to the legacy of the past. 
But that's sort of how philosophy seems from the outside. Our task, as I say, is to get to know philosophy from the inside. So what is worldview then? What is, as I said, you may think about its relationship to ideology too. A worldview, he writes, sets experience on a definite path and within a determinate range. And it does this in such a broad way that it does not allow the worldview itself to come into question. The worldview thereby narrows and thwarts genuine experience from the standpoint of the worldview that is precisely its strong point. Now, I personally happen to think that that is an excellent description of ideology. It sets experience on a definite path and within a determinate range. You might say in our contemporary uh, terms that it's an Overton window. It, whether you move it, whether you expand it, it still sets experience within a definite path and a determinate range and doesn't allow the worldview itself to come into question. By contrast, philosophy opens experience, he writes, but for that reason cannot, be, cannot ground history immediately. So one of the things that comes into play in this section in Heidegger is, can philosophy be immediately effective? Can you just overcome the old history of Western philosophy and contemporary nihilism, come up with a system that suddenly grounds a new politics? In a sense, philosophy is so upstream from culture, as we might put it, that you can't expect any immediate results from it. Remember, he said earlier, it's useless, but it's sovereign. And there's a tension there because sovereignty exerts an influence, whereas the idea that it's useless might not make that clear at first. So worldview constrains experience, philosophy opens experience. A worldview is always an end, mostly a long protracted end that doesn't even know itself as an end. Philosophy is always a beginning and requires an overcoming of itself. A worldview, he writes, must forego new possibilities in order to remain one with itself. And here, too, you might think of all the old outlooks and ideologies and dogmas that can't comprehend or incorporate anything new because they, otherwise they would remain themselves. They wouldn't remain one with themselves. They shut out the new experience. They shut out the new the essential transformation. But philosophy is different. And philosophy can be suspended for a long time and can even apparently disappear. So I'm reading the passage here for those of you who are checking in and out on philosophy and worldview and contributions to philosophy of the event. Both, he writes, have their distinctive times and keep themselves within history on utterly different levels of Dasein. So it's been my aim, in a way, to try to help people to see the relationship between three levels, let's say. Politics, your day-to-day -day politics of political parties and happenings and goings-on, and even, you might say, the advances and retreats in the culture wars, all of the parties who are fighting, all of the action, all of the hustle and bustle, that's one level. Another level is the level of worldview or ideology where there's some more consistent elaboration of the ideas that are being reflected at this level of activity. Because after all, there is a level of ideas that we need to think about and that we need to be aware of, and that the political level is somehow a reflection, however poor and pale. Well, the philosophical level is even above the level of ideology or worldview because of the reasons that Heidegger has just described. So there's an opportunity to go up from the hustle and bustle of the culture war and of day-to-day -day politics to the ideas and the worldviews that form and configure it to philosophy as a more fundamental reflection on the truth of being and the history of being. Hi, Isaac in chat. Thanks for joining this little experiment of ours. So philosophy and worldview have their distinct times and they operate on different levels of the human being. They're distinct activities. Whenever you hear Heidegger thinks, um, science as a technical cultural meaning and talk of values and ideals, you're not yet in philosophy. Philosophy doesn't talk about values or culture or ideals. All of that is still in that intermediary worldview level. Okay, one second. As I said, I had just basically just bookmarked a handful of passages that I thought could be interesting to go through with you here. Yeah, so Heidegger believes and argues 
that the guiding question of philosophy can be we can recover it. We still have we still have access to philosophical questioning, but largely it's been buried and misinterpreted through epistemology and ontology. So even our even our philosophical vocabulary, even the words that make it sound like we are philosophizing or thinking about philosophy, reflecting on what matters philosophically, even those terms like epistemology and ontology, he thinks, can be misleading because they belong to that old history from Plato to Nietzsche that we need to be outside, beyond. We need to work our way through that and get out the other side of it for there to be another beginning of philosophy, another inception, a true relation to being as the original pouring forth or what have you. So we got to be on the lookout for worldview, according to Heidegger. Worldview is always machination against the tradition. And it's aimed at overcoming tradition and mastering tradition. But philosophy has its origin in the fundamental grounds. It has to, in a sense, retreat away from the hustle and bustle. So Heidegger also writes, and for those of you who know me because of my work on Dugan, which some of you do, I have to tell you that I interviewed Dugan about Heidegger. That interview is an appendix in the book called The Rise of the Fourth Political Theory. And it's also on my academia page. So if you search academia.edu, Michael Millerman, you'll see my interview with Dugan about Heidegger. And I ask him about this passage because Dugan combines in himself the functions of philosopher, ideologue, and activist, at least those three functions. And yet he identifies as a Heideggerian. And the challenge is that Heidegger says the following, that philosophy and worldview again, which you can interpret as ideology, philosophy and worldview are so incommensurable that no image could possibly depict the distinction between them. Every image would necessarily bring them too close together. You've got to separate the two. You have to understand the two if we want to get inside philosophy, according to Heidegger. And he even analyzes how I just told you, sometimes the philosophical hustle and bustle can be masking a real poverty of philosophy, he says the same thing about cultural hustle and bustle and religious activity also, because he writes that the, the covert yet obsolete domination of the churches, the over familiarity and accessibility of worldviews for the masses. So pick your, anybody can pick a worldview and buy it on a t-shirt. The indifferent pursuit of philosophy as erudition. I think you can quote something in Greek or Latin, but you never let it touch your soul or transform your spirit. At the same time, the immediate and immediate pursuit of philosophy as the scholastic quibbling of churches and worldviews, all of this, which we all know so well and can learn by just looking around us, all of this will for a long time keep at bay philosophy as the creative co-grounding of Dasein in opposition to the current and adaptable omniscience of public opinion. Heidegger's philosophy is far from public opinion, if you read it and try to get inside of it. This situation, he writes, that everybody's talking and nobody's thinking, or everybody seems to be doing something but is kind of like the poet who muddies his waters to make them appear deep. This situation is admittedly nothing to regret, he writes, but is only a sign that philosophy is proceeding toward the genuine destiny of its essence. And everything depends, everything depends on our not disturbing this destiny. And indeed, not disdaining it through an apologetics for philosophy, which would be a machination that by necessity is always beneath the rank of philosophy. Okay, well, here we have to, uh, we have to admit our guilt. We do make some effort here to make an apology for philosophy. But Heidegger says, even the apologetics don't treat philosophy with its rank. It doesn't need your defense. It has its own inherent destiny that it's going to unfold with or without you. So again, this passage is drawing the sharp distinction between worldview ideology and philosophy. So what do we need, if not an apology? We do need a meditation, he says, on the drawing near of this destiny of philosophy. Needful is the knowledge of that which disturbs, disfigures, and would lend validity to a mere semblance of philosophy. How is it that today something is coming to pass as thinking that is just the corpse of thinking. To be sure, this knowledge would misinterpret itself, he writes, 
if it allowed itself to be enticed into making that disturbing element an object of debate and refutation. We don't need a parliamentarianism of the essence of philosophy. The knowledge of the distorted essence must remain a knowledge in passing. Remember, this is not a book. He might dislike the fact that we're doing this on a live stream here and just talking about it, but it's an invitation to each and every one of you to sub make yourselves to the possibility of an essential transformation of what it means to be human. Let me just go to the chat because people are writing. Uh, we're going to school today. I hope you enjoyed the discussion. Twitter account got nuked. Sorry to hear that. Uh, do you know what Slavoj Žižek's opinion of Alexander Dugan is? I don't. If anybody does, feel free to post it here. The introductory chapter of the fourth political theory reminds you of Mark Fisher's capitalist realism. Okay, thanks for the heads up. Haven't read it. Don't know about it. But I can tell you as an aside that if you read the fourth political theory and then you read some contemporary national conservatives or critics of liberal democracy, including Patrick Deneen and others, I assume you'll see something similar if you read that book called The Demon in Democracy, which I haven't read yet, and you see some of it more or less in critics of liberalism, but Dugan has developed it in certain directions that are unfamiliar, I think, to the mainstream national conservatism discourse. So... Simply put, whereas national conservatism is Anglo-American in its focus for the most part, well, not, not necessarily, but it's less likely to draw on sources like Heidegger, for example, and it's certainly less likely to draw on sources like medieval Islamic mysticism, which Dugan does, at least for its imagery, but also, I think, for its eschatology and for its doctrine of the imagination and so on. Okay, thanks again for the nice comments there. So everything depends on not disturbing philosophy's destiny and yet meditating on what it means. You probably have seen the quote, the most thought-provoking thing about our time is that nobody's thinking and doesn't treat anything as thought-provoking. So you don't have to fight it, but you do have to understand, you do have to make an essence to, you do have to make an effort to understand it. The essence of worldview, he writes again, compels the formation of any worldview to waver back and forth amid the most extreme opposites and thereby also at times to stabilize itself in compromises. The fact that worldview can precisely be what is most properly at issue for individuals, for their respective life experience, and for the shaping of their most characteristic opinions, and the fact that as a counter move to this, worldview can also step forth as total and as effacing all such opinions, all of that belongs to the essence of worldview. So even if we don't go into, the, into Heidegger's philosophy and we just understand his criticism of worldview and of culture and of the narrowing of, of experience and it's whether it vacillates from one extreme to another, all of that still belongs to its own essence. And none of that is what we're trying to move. None of that will get you to an essential transformation of the human being. Not that that's the goal. That's just what happens when you start to think as Heidegger believes it is the human destiny, so to speak, to do, to think about, not even to think about, but to think being, to think the truth of being. A lot of stuff going on in the chat. That's great. So I would just want to read to you a still from that same section here. Just these passages are so beautiful, truly beautiful. I'm going to try to slow down and read them so they can resonate with you. Any attitude which as total claims for itself the determination and regulation of every kind of acting and thinking, must ineluctably take everything else that might step forth as necessary and consider it to be hostile and even degrading. You can get so much out of that passage. Anything that calls a, total, a, a totalitarian in the sense that is a total discourse, a total worldview, a total ideology, anything that challenges it, pokes it from the outside, somehow finds a gap or a crack is regarded as hostile or degrading. You all know that. How could it even be acceptable to a total worldview that such a thing is even nearly possible? You see why I got in trouble, I would say, at the University of Toronto for working on Dugan wasn't because I was a proponent of his thought so much as I was entertaining the possibility of his thought. And here, Adiger writes very clearly, you can't even entertain the possibility of a total world of you being wrong without it treating you as hostile and degrading.
Let me read that again. How could it even be acceptable to a total worldview that such a thing is even merely possible, let alone essential? Something that at once lies under it and lies above it and that incorporates it into other necessities. You see something that transcends the ideology or the worldview, puts it in its place, calls out its limitations and overcomes them. Well, it just has no toleration for that. In other words, worldview is again in a total war against philosophy. If it even it can't be in a war against true philosophy because it can't have a true understanding of philosophy or it wouldn't be worldview. An insurmountable difficulty arises here and no compromise or denial will ever remove it. By the way, I'm reading this on my balcony. I'm getting very animated because this material is inspiring. And I'm just worried that at some point a neighbor is going to come out here and try to, uh, okay, we'll see. An insurmountable difficulty arises here and no compromise or denial will ever remove it. Now the next passage is in italics. The total worldview must close itself off from the opening of its ground and from the fathoming of the ground of the realm of its creativity, i.e., its creating can never come to its own essence and become a creating beyond itself, because the total worldview would thereby have put itself into question. Theology and a worldview cannot put themselves into question. They can never think about their own presuppositions, about their own ground, about the alternatives to them in a fundamental way, or like on a horizontal way, or on a vertical way. They're trapped within their narrow confines. And the result is this, the creating, cr creative thought, which isn't something that you think up, it's like an expression of being in you and through you, is replaced right from the start by bustle, bustle, okay? Hustle and bustle. The ways and risks of erstwhile creativity are incorporated into the gigantism of machination, and the machinational is the mere semblance of creative life. Only questioning. And the decision in favor of question worthiness. What is question worthy? And what does it mean to question what is question worthy? Even the question what is question worthy is a step in the right direction. And only that can be set in opposition to world. Every attempt at mediation from whichever side it may come weakens the position, he writes, and takes away the realm of possibility for a genuine battle. Those of you who are coming in and out, we're reading from. Total political belief, he writes, and the equally total Christian belief are nevertheless involved in compromise and tactics. So both the thesis and anti antithesis, the pro and con, the for and against, they're both implicated in the logic of worldview and ideology. That should not be surprising about these beliefs, for they're of the same essence. As total attitudes, they're both founded on the renunciation of essential decisions. Their battle is not a creation. And indeed, it above all, claim the total. Especially if we define philosophy as long as we're thinking in the form of the previous philosophy, metaphysics, and are taking this philosophy as it was molded by Christianity and by the systematics of German idealism. So... The first opposition is between philosophy as the original. We just went through some of the differences. Worldview as ideology constrains experience and it never questions its own foundation, whereas philosophy is always questioning, going to the beginning, looking for what's most question worthy. And yet philosophy as, it, as we have come to know it belongs to worldview. And therefore we must distinguish Philosophy as we have come to know it in the history of Western metaphysics from the philosophy of another beginning, a new beginning of philosophy. And that's why, again, for those of you who follow me because of my work on Dugan, that's why Dugan's first book on Heidegger is called Martin Heidegger, The Philosophy of Another Beginning. Because the philosophy of Western metaphysics has now become circumscribed within ideology and worldview, but for reasons that I'm oversimplifying. Let me just turn for a second to the chat. Please understand, please explain my understanding of Dasein in the face of death. That's a separate discussion. I don't think this book here now is the place to go into it, but I can tell you that I'm publishing this year with Artos my book, Beginning with Heidegger, which is based on my dissertation. And there I have an analysis explanation of being towards death and being in time to try to situate it in a way that makes it more understandable. Uh, than it is on its own. So let me just see here. Have I read uh, that off? No, I haven't. Uh, 
Okay, audio book, no plans for an audio book yet, but I can talk to Arctos about it. It's probably not a problem. Uh, liked my, okay, great, thanks. Awesome, I appreciate all of the activity in the chat. That's, that's fantastic. So let's go to the last paragraph of this, thing, of this section on philosophy and worldview. He says, insofar as, as soon as philosophy in the other beginning, remember a new beginning, a new inception of philosophy, finds itself back to its inceptual essence. We don't fully know yet what that means, but somehow it's going to be thinking back to the origin in a way that takes us beyond the history of Western metaphysics and to the question of the truth of being with a Y, as I already explained, to distinguish it from being with an I, which belongs within the history of Western metaphysics. That happens, then there is revealed what is abys abyssal in philosophy, philosophy as this open abyss, not as nihilism, not as a nothing matters, but what's abyssal in philosophy, which must, he writes, turn back to what is inceptual in order to bring itself into the free domain of its meditation, in order to bring into the free domain of its meditation this strange and perpetually unusual fissure, okay? Gap or crack or abyss. So let me just recapitulate briefly. We started with the first page of contributions to philosophy of the event, which says that even though this title sounds lame and dull, contributions to philosophy, as though it can be an encyclopedia entry about Locke or Leibniz, it's actually trying to go into an essential transformation of what it means to be human, reconnecting us to the meaning of words by meditating on the fate of philosophy, how it has become worldview and ideology and hustle and bustle and empty talk. And he's given some indications here that if we treat philosophy inceptually, although we don't know what that means fully yet, then we can inaugurate or submit ourselves to undergo this new beginning of philosophy. And the reason I talked about Descartes and the meditations before was to remind you, don't just take this as a series of propositions. You always have to be, as it were, existentially exposed to the possibility of transformation. I can tell you that in my opinion, when you read any philosopher worth his while at a fundamental level, you always have to read him with a willingness to be fundamentally transformed. Because if you don't read with that philosophical intention, then you won't have access to the inner life. Of what Let me just stop for a second. I have a couple of other passages bookmarked. I got to say, I didn't think it was going to take 40 minutes to go through the first one of them. And crucially, if you think that Heidegger has might have something to offer, after all, Derrida, Strauss, Dugin, Heidegger, Levinas, many, many people, Foucault, they all thought that this was a historical event. Heidegger was a historical event. He was, he was our destiny in some way. And it's worth for trying to think about what he says and what he thinks is important. And he thinks that meditation on philosophy constitutes an important task for philosophy. So here's what he says. Section 19 is called Philosophy on the Question, Who Are We? By the way, is this okay for everybody? Hopefully it sounds okay and is somewhat interesting. As I said, this is a first experiment. I'm enjoying it. Philosophy, who are we? In other words, you might reflect on yourself in order to find a basis for certainty, but he thinks that you must reflect on yourself. Oh, sorry, I said there was a connection problem, so I'm going to say that again. He says, you might reflect on yourself in order to find a basis for certainty, somewhat like Descartes did when he was trying to find an unshakable foundation for truth. But he says, if we're going to do this with Heidegger, then reflection on the self must be for the sake of the truth of being. The same is true in being time and the analytic of Dasein. It's carried out for the sake of the question of the truth of being. We examine Dasein because we treat it as a window into what being self might be. We're the being for whom being is a question. And therefore, we can learn about being by examining ourselves correctly. So he writes further, the exposition of this ground, the ground of our own being, reaches back into a still more original realm than is the realm which had to be broached in the trans transition by the initial determination of sign in the fundamental ontology of being and time. In other words, what he's saying here is that 
don't stop at being in time. Being in time was a transitional thinking into the truth of being that we must go beyond. It's a determination, nevertheless, that even now has not been sufficiently unfolded and made prominent in the knowledge of those who are questioning. So according to the matter of things, we have to go beyond being in time, for example, to the contributions. And yet many people haven't even begun to approach being in time correctly. And there too, philosophy turned into bustle. Sorry to hear that the stream was cutting out. Hopefully it's working better now. So, insofar as, according to the originary exposition of the ground of the essence of meditation, as meditation on oneself, he writes, we ourselves are transposed into the realm of questioning, then from this point of view, the philosophical question can be posed in the form, who are we? So, again, meditation on ourselves for the sake of access to the question of the truth of being. And yeah, look, this is going to be interesting. Disregarding the question, he writes, of the who. So we start with the question, who are we? Who are we? But discarding for a minute the question of the who, he writes, which ones do we mean in speaking of we? So not who are we, but who are we? What's the we here at first? Ourselves, those at this moment, objectively present, those here and now, in other words, me and you, or what? But where would the enclosing circle be drawn? Or do we mean the human being as such? So does the question, who are we, mean who are we, the human being? And yet he says, the human being is, a, is somehow historically determined. And again, not historically by the culture of this or that place, but by being as history. Our conception of what it means to be is itself history. I know it's not so easy to understand, but let's go on for a minute. Do we mean ourselves as this particular people? Who are we, the French? Who are we, the German? Who are we, the Jews? Who are we, the Canadians? Who are we, the Spanish? Who are we, the Italian? Is that what we mean, Heidegger asks? Do we mean ourselves as this particular people? Even then, however, we're not the only ones, but are a people with other peoples. And how is the essence of a people determined? It is clear at once, he writes, the way in which the questioned, namely the we, is initially established in the question, already contains a decision about the who. So in, in every definition of, the, of ourselves as a group or community, we've already presupposed some understanding of being, some relation to being, some determination of being. That means we cannot, untouched by the question of the who, postulate the we and the us as, so to speak, something objectively present to which only the determination of the who would be lacking. You can't take the group for granted. Even this question cannot be asked or answered straightforwardly. And yet, as long as the essence of philosophy is not grasped as meditation on the truth of being, and as long as the necessity of the meditation on oneself, which thereby arises, has not become effective, the question as a question is already exposed to severe misgivings. I wish I could just read this whole book with you. It's not going to happen. But philosophy, he does believe that philosophy is always the philosophy of a people. And yet you can't take for granted what that means to say people. And he opposed the biological determination of peoplehood. He was very critical of Nazi biologists. You can take it or leave it, like it or dislike it, but it's a fact. Because he thought that biological determinations of peoplehood are not based on inquiry into the truth of being and inquiry into the relationship between language and being. And all of that is the bread and butter of inceptual thinking and of Heidegger's meditations. Okay, I have 10% battery life left. That's not going to cut it. We've been going at it for 50 minutes. That's a long time. I know you people may have other things to do. we got a great um, group of people here. I'm so glad that you were interested and made some time. I went through about three of, I don't know, seven or eight passages, which I chose from about at random from about 200 that I would gladly have discussed with you. So I think we're going to stop the experiment here for tonight. And if you enjoyed this and you'd like me to do it again, and you have any suggestions about how you might like to do it differently, please let me know. But 
from time to time, I think we're just going to do this, a live stream with commentary on some passages in Heidegger and in other thinkers. And we'll find other things to discuss too. There's a lot to choose from. So thanks a lot for your comments. There's a question here. Where can you find my translations of Heidegger and Dugan? I don't have any translations of Heidegger, but you can just pick up like this, Contributions to Philosophy of the Event, for example, Being in Time, any other works. I am translating one of Dugan's books on Heidegger, but that's going to take me a long time to finish. If you go to michaelmillerman.ca or if you just search on academia.edu for me, you'll see my essays on Dugan, Heidegger, Strauss, and other people, and also an interview that I did with Dugan about Heidegger. So thanks a lot, the participation. Just I'm so glad to see people writing. I wasn't sure. I thought this might be an empty house. So thanks for coming. Hope you enjoyed it. See you again next time. Have a nice night. All the best. Goodbye.